Hi, I'm Mark Palmer. I'm the city engineer for the city of Puyallup. Uh, I'd like to shout out to the city of Puyallup's been recognized as one of the leaders in LID, low impact development uh, installations throughout the, the state as well as the country. And this project that we're going to look at now, which is the 8th Avenue Northwest LID retrofit project, is one of the reasons why. We've got many more examples at this point, but this one is one of the primary reasons for why we're recognized. The project started off as one of our neighborhood rain garden installation projects. Um, Steve West House, which is right here, uh, and Bert Hollis, which is behind us here, were two of the leaders of getting the rain garden neighborhood installation done in this area. We had seven rain gardens installed as the first installation of the uh, neighborhood rain garden project. Steve's rain garden is here behind us. Uh, we have some other neighbors that haven't maintained theirs quite as well, but they're still working efficiently. Those started the, uh, the neighborhood getting together, and actually that's what we found with our neighborhood rain garden program is that these neighborhoods have coalesced into a cohesive group. Neighborhoods that didn't even talk to each other before now came together and became a social group and actually worked together to put these rain garden projects together. And the rain garden projects were community events. We actually invited a lot of people from the community to come out and help install these rain gardens. We had a, a, a local radio celebrity, Cisco Morris, come here and broadcast from the site to advertise the site. Again, part of this is how to treat stormwater runoff in a different manner, how to infiltrate it, retain that stormwater on your own property and not put it into the system and cause runoff and pollution that harms Puget Sound. So it's an educational effort as well as actually being a practical installation of stormwater features. So in the neighborhood rain garden program, uh, we decided that we were gonna put the rain gardens in the front yards of the houses. And that's primarily because we were wanting these out here to be demonstrations for people walking by to see these rain gardens and to understand through our interpretive signs what these rain gardens are doing, how they're functioning to prevent stormwater runoff and pollution. And this is collecting the roof runoff from the front of this house uh, through the downspout, comes in the far side of the rain garden over here and then infiltrates through the rain garden soils and the plants and roots here. Uh, if it does have an overflow, the overflow would be where the drain rock is up here. Again, I've been out here in torrential downpours and I've not seen a drop of rain anywhere in rain gardens or on the street out here. We've got fairly good infiltrating soils out here and it's doing exactly what it's intended to do and it's infiltrating all that storm water that reaches it. One of the things that was rather unique about our rain garden program is we did work with consultants to actually custom design each of these rain gardens. Each of these rain gardens has its own character per what the property owner wanted. Some people wanted a lot of flowering plants and a lot of color, a lot of show. Others wanted low maintenance. They didn't want to have to do too much of the rain garden. And each one of these was custom designed to each individual homeowner. So one of the ways that the rain gardens work, you can do it one of two ways. You can either have a engineered bioretention soil that you install in place of the soil that is in the ground here or in this case we had good sandy soil and it was just amended with a compost, uh, a 40 to 50 percent mix of compost and mixed in and it's about 18 inches deep. So that provides a good filtering and infiltration layer uh, that does water quality treatment and allows the water to infiltrate through the soil uh, and get its treatment along with the root structure of the plants. That's what makes a rain garden work. But then we also had a problem out here in the street. We had a street that was relatively flat, had no storm drainage, no catch basins, no way to collect the stormwater runoff, had a standing water all over. In fact, right behind me here was an area that was just a gravel shoulder area that's where Cisco Morris's tent was going to be for the, the show. We actually had to put a bunch of material in there to displace a bunch of water that was there, and this was in June. Uh, we made an application to the Department of Ecology to get funding to do this uh, low impact development street and we were successful in getting that and then we were able to construct this project in uh, 2012. We did this again as a demonstration to show all the various modes that you could do low impact development, taking this what was 100% impervious right of way section from sidewalk to sidewalk and make it 100% porous from sidewalk to sidewalk.
So we've looked at the uh, rain gardens on the private property and immediately adjacent to that in the right of way we have bioretention cells that are part of the 8th Avenue project. Bioretention cells would be normally designed with a little bit more rigid water modeling to determine that it's going to be able to handle the flows that are running onto it. In our particular case, it's a little bit different because we don't have any impervious surfaces adjacent to it. Nothing's running into these bioretention cells other than what falls on it directly. But you would be looking at that and you'd be more concerned about groundwater separation because you have over 5,000 square feet of impervious pollution generating services typically in a bioretention cell is the definition so that you'd have to look at the separation to groundwater being greater in those cases. Maintenance is always a big question on these issues and again obviously the homeowners here are responsible for the own maintenance on their own rain gardens and the city actually had these homeowners voluntarily sign uh, maintenance agreements that they would maintain their rain gardens because they are stormwater features. Mixed results on that and I think that's kind of to be expected. It's hard to get 100% participation. Nonetheless, the rain gardens out here in the right of way are doing pretty well. They've been in the ground about three years now and, and looking healthy. So as we've talked about, there's no impervious surfaces running into these bioretention cells. So the plant selection that's in all these bioretention cells here is gonna be slightly different than what you may see in a rain garden where it is getting contributing runoff from adjacent impervious surfaces uh, where you may need to have something that can, uh, for lack of a better term, have wet feet and take a little bit of water and inundation over short periods of time. Here, what we really have is, is a belt and suspenders and suspenders approach to stormwater control. We've got uh, a porous sidewalk, a porous road, bioretention, and actually all these bioretention cells are hydraulically connected with stormwater pipes to a stormwater system on the end where we have a monitor that we can check to see if we get any flows off of it. And that was one of the things we had as an objective in our grant. Have we eliminated all stormwater flows? And to date, we have not had any flows off here. As I've mentioned, I've been out here during very intense rainstorms, and there hasn't been ponding water in any of these bioretention cells. We've gotten no runoff anywhere within the street section because it's all infiltrating through the soil. But that's part of what it was set up to be is if anything failed, the pavement would run off into the bioretention. If the bioretention failed, it would run into the stormwater system and run off into the regular stormwater system. In between the rain gardens and the bioretention cells, we got one of our other permeable uh, demonstrations and we have a uh, porous paver. The pavers themselves are not porous, but we have gaps in between the pavers where a 3 8 clean gravel is put in that allows the water to pass through those and it runs off the blocks and then into the gaps in between the pavers into 12 inches of clean rock underneath this to allow that water to infiltrate down through under the pavers here. Uh, you do need a hard edge restraint. Which is where we have the, the regular concrete edge restraints on either side of this to keep the pavers held into place. Sidewalks are the maintenance responsibility of the homeowners in the city of Puyallup. As you can imagine, that really doesn't happen a lot, even though that's what's supposed to happen. But in the case of these pavers, homeowners, if there was a problem or a, a, a root intrusion might have caused a, a couple pavers to pop up, it's something they could go out and easily repair. Looking at the uh, pervious pavers and the maintenance, there's, there's usually a concern because we do have these exposed areas in between the grids here where we have the rock. Typically, that's a concern. As you can see here, we don't have a lot of weeds. And part of that reason is it's 3 8 inch clean rock and there's not really anything for the roots to get in there and get a hold of and grow. You will get an occasional plant, but it doesn't tend to grow up very high. So this is one of the key components of this project is we've got porous asphalt. Uh, as you're probably aware, when you have regular asphalt, it's called uh, hot mix asphalt. It's designed to keep the water out of the pavement. And that's typical standard design is we work really hard to keep water out of the pavement. So we keep it out of the subgrade because if soils get wet, they typically get weakened. This is doing exactly the opposite. It's allowing the water to pass through the pavement and into the subgrade and infiltrate in the soil. So it's mimicking what 
more naturally occurs if this is in a forested condition and we had soil sitting here instead of a hard surface. So it's passing all that through. And the way we get around the fact that we're allowing that water to saturate the subgrade is we make a thicker subsection in there. We take the uh, pavement and we've got, I believe, three inches to four inches of asphalt here. It's a porous asphalt. We have another layer of rock that's on there just to allow the paving machines to work on top of this. And then 18 inches of aggregate that's open graded aggregate. It's got 30 to 40 percent of voids. It's got all that airspace in there that can store the water until it has a chance to infiltrate in the soil. That depth not only is it allows that to hold the water to infiltrate, it also allows the flexible pavement to be stronger. By adding a thicker section, asphalt, which is a flexible pavement, uses all that rock underneath it as a supporting section and gives it additional strength, makes us a much stronger road and is able to resist that soil that gets saturated down there and weakened because we're allowing that water to get into it. And as you can see on this road, this road's been down for quite some time, about three years now. And we're not seeing any kind of raveling. We're not seeing any kind of uh, uh, rutting. Uh, it's holding up, again, because it's a strong pavement section. It's got a lot of rock underneath of it, and it's supporting it and is very structural. Our roads are a 3% crown for regular roads. This is not just a 1% crown. And again, it's just enough crown that if there is a problem with drainage, it'll at least run off to the sides, in this case, into these rain gardens. We were worried about not having edge restraint, so that's why you're seeing the, the flat concrete curb that is along here. We, we wanted to have edge restraint because we were a little concerned about porous pavements not being able to stand up to traffic running right on the edge and breaking it down. We did edge restraint here and it was flat, and that was again to allow any flow that might go off and go into the bioretention cell. Maintenance for these roads, as far as, again, the city of Puyallup's a little bit unique. We've got a very aggressive street maintenance program where we sweep with a regenerative air sweeper. It's at least once a month and many times more cases than that. We're not treating this street any differently than we do our regular streets. We come out and we sweep this street once a month and the porosity on the street, we keep testing it continuously, has not dropped since we've installed it. One thing I will point out, because of the way we did this, we narrowed the street, we made it curvilinear for traffic calming effect got these long driveways. When you're designing projects and you need to have vacuum sweeping as your main method of maintenance, you probably don't want to have these sharp corners where you can't get a vacuum truck in to sweep. We, so we don't maintain these aprons because we can't get our vacuum sweepers in here easily, uh, but yet they seem to be doing fine uh, even without that. We'll look at the last layer of uh, redundancy. Uh, we had the permeable paver sidewalks, bioretention cells, porous asphalt, and finally on this side, uh, to complete the demonstration project, we have pervious concrete. Uh, you'll kind of notice that pervious concrete does have a, a different look to it. Uh, it doesn't get finished like normal concrete, which is one of the main differences between it and regular concrete. Uh, it's basically knocked off with a, a bunion screed, floated once, joints installed, and then it's covered up with plastic because it's got a low moisture concrete and then allow it to cure its full seven days. Uh, again, it has a, a little bit of a popcorn-y appearance. Pervious concrete will infiltrate at a much greater rate than either of the other two pavers. Maintenance, mainly sweeping on a sidewalk doesn't even usually get that. One of the issues we have with pervious concrete, it seems to be permeating most of the installations we have, and I see we're getting some of that here, is it has a great propensity to, to grow moss. For some reason, moss is able to get into those voids. Uh, as long as it's a highly used sidewalk, it doesn't seem to get up too much. Some uh, installations where you have trees, or as we have further down here, we've got a laurel hedge right against the uh, sidewalk on the south side, so it gets a lot of shade. Uh, you'll tend to get a little bit more moss. It doesn't affect the permeability of the pavement, but it does uh, have an appearance and a potential uh, safety issue as well. Pervious concrete does require a certified installer. Uh, you want to make sure that happens. They need to understand how to put this down. Uh, the mix is critical. Uh, pervious concrete can be made in as small as a one truck batch. So small jobs work very well with pervious concrete. Whereas this driveway here, if we were going to replace this with a pervious pavement, would be difficult to do with porous asphalt. Uh, porous asphalt 
probably from most uh, accounts that I've heard needs about a 40 ton minimum batch. So that's a lot of asphalt to make it for a porous asphalt. So you need a larger project for the porous asphalt. That may change as more porous asphalt becomes more commonly used. We have tours of this neighborhood frequently. because Our staff will give them tours, explain the site, but people could also tour the site by themselves because we have interpretive signs like the City of Puyallup's rain garden sign here that explains how a rain garden functions, how it improves stormwater quality for Puget Sound and improves the environment for, for fish and other animals in Puget Sound. Mm -hmm.